to memory. When you study this, notice the three layers. Okay. Which include, do you see the foot processes of the protocyte? Processes. You know, they're uh, fused to a basement membrane. <coughs> basement membrane is basically uh, connective tissue. There's a lot of proteins in connective tissue. Pro, a lot of proteins. I'll just kind of like draw here. That connective tissue basement membrane on one side it's fused hydrocytes, on the other side is the glomerular capillaries with, with their fenestrations. So the fenestrations have been measured. Um, the diameter of that hole, that space, is something like 70 nanometers. That's the fenestration. <coughs> so that's too big. You want to limit the filtration there. So when you put the foot processes on the other side, the slit that creates is much thinner. It's been measured at about 14 nanometers. The slit between there and there, 14 nanometer filtration slit. It's like you're limiting the filtration. Therefore, you make it a better filter. So I've always been confused about this picture. I remember when I first looked at it as a student, I didn't really know what I was looking at. I thought each one of these was a cell, but it's not. It's one cell. All those foot processes are of a cell, so that's why I made this figure. I just turned it on its side. One, two, three. So what we drew here was actually more like one pot of site. Like they're all, here's one big cell. And the foot processing is like, that's one foot process. So the one, two, three on my slide is one, two, three here, you know, so you're clear. The direction of filtration is up on the slide. You go from blood, you filter the plasma, you get pushed through all three 
layers through this little diaphragm here and you get make it through the slit what makes it out is called the filtrate okay. so it's a very good filter it, this filter filter is based on basically two principles size and charge so professor, yeah one is the foot process two is the basement membrane and three is mm -hmm. the glue marrow yeah the exactly so note the layers, note the direction of filtration, filtering based upon filtration, based upon the size and the charge of a given molecule. Small positive charges usually get filtered. So molecules that are small, molecules that have a positive charge, their filtration is favored. Favors. Small positive charged molecules. basically size and charge. Positive charges usually do better because the basement membrane is filled with proteins and proteins usually carry a negative charge. So positively charged molecules like are attracted to that and slip through. That's not to say negatively charged molecules cannot be filtered. They can if they're small enough. So those are the two basic things. Now, what's more impressive is if you actually look at a real picture of this from the inside of the capillary, from the outside of the capillary. With the lights off, um, these electron micrographs show the inside of glomerular capillary. If you can see all the fenestrations on the inside, how porous that is, little peppered little holes there. Uh, maybe difficult to see in the back. When you look in front of the computer screen, there's so many fenestrations. The size of that are big. Now, so on the outside of the capillary, here's the uh, cell. That's the potocyte. Here's all the foot processes. You can see how the things interdigitate. And the picture is way more intricate and beautiful than what an illustrator can show us. Okay. And the size of that slit, 1,400. So the slits, only small stuff's getting through, basically. Okay. It's a very good filter. It's like when I make coffee in the morning, I put the little coffee filter there, I put the grinds there, and I put the water through it. I should only have brown liquid. If I see coffee grounds in my coffee, that's not a good filter. It let the grinds in. The same thing here. You don't, be, you, you don't want to let like big proteins or other large molecules through. You want to filter those out. Just, just the small molecules make it through. We can regulate the small molecules. So, moving on. <clears throat> what makes it a good filter? The glomerulus. What makes it a good filter? Qualitatively, the kidneys, uh, glomerular capillaries, filter blood plasma just like any other capillary bed. Quantitatively, the glomerular capillaries, they produce 180 liters of filtrate daily in contrast to the two to four liters formed by other capillary beds. So that's a lot of throughput. So, you know, let, let, let's remember that you're only filtering the plasma. Total blood volume is about five or six liters. Plasma is only about half of that. So you're only filtering two or three liters of your plasma. Um, 180 liters every day. So that's like you're filtering your blood volume 70 times a day. Now that's great if your function is excretion. If you have toxins in your blood and you want to filter them out, that's a good way to do it. Put it through the kidney 70 times each day and you'll probably get it out.
What if you're a, a nurse and you're supposed to monitor the urine output? What if they stop making urine? What does that tell you? Well, you just better get the doctor or something. I mean, something's going wrong. The kidneys are shutting down. You should produce about one mil a minute urine. It's about 30 mils every half hour. You should also look at the color of the urine. A good color is like straw or dilute lemonade. That's a pretty good color. It starts to get darker yellow, darker or even brown. You're probably dehydrated. <clears throat> okay, so the throughput of this filter, 180 liters a day. There's a term for that, filter so much called high renal clearance. If it's small enough to make it through the filtration membrane, you're gonna clear it out. Okay, no problem. That breaks down to like, filter the plasma 70 times. It's kind of what textbooks teach us. Those numbers, very good. that push through so much fluid. Uh, we talked about this before. Um, filtration and blood colloid osmotic pressure, there's kind of like uh, opposing forces here. Now, with this capillary bed, because there's a capsule around this capillary bed, it exerts a pressure. You're trying to push fluid out, but you have a fluid-filled capsule that you're trying to push fluid into. So that adds another thing we have to consider. So this is how you would calculate what we call the net filtration pressure. I gotta give you some numbers. Calculating N F P the net filtration pressure, as long as that's big enough, you'll, you'll push fluids through and you'll generate the filtrate, the proper amount. <clears throat> well, the equation's given down here. And FP equals the outward pressures minus the inward pressures. So you got one big outward pressure. It's the hydrostatic pressure, GC, 55. The hydrostatic pressure observed the GC glomerular capillaries. And they put a number to it. It's like 55. Now, if you think back, when we talked about capillary filtration before, that number was lower. It was like 35. It's higher at the uh, glomerulus. That's a good thing. You get more of that, you'll be able to push more through. And it's good because you have to overcome two things, it's not just one thing. In the blood, um, the osmotic pressure is about 30, so you want to subtract that. <clears throat> you want to subtract, um, we call it OPGC, osmotic pressure, glomerular capillaries. That's a opposing force, another opposing force is the hydrostatic pressure exerted by the capsule, the Bowman's capsule. Hydrostatic pressure, they call it CS, it's the pressure by the capsule. <coughs> so, recap, OP, just plain old osmotic pressure of the blood, HP is capsular pressure, These two pressures, I'm putting in parentheses and adding them because these are opposing the outward pressure. The HP is the outward pressure. 
are 55. The opposing pressures are these two in parentheses. So the arrow is pointing in the other way, inward pressures. <coughs> so it's 55 minus those two pressures, which are 30 and 15. So it's 55 minus 45. Out minus in. You have a net 10, called a plus 10. <coughs> so that's what's calculated there. That, that's the NFP. That's the net plus 10. So that's enough to get us enough um, communal clearance there. And so I want you to think about why that 55 is 55 and not 35 like regular capital events. So let's remember that mean arterial pressure close to the heart is 93. When you get all the way down to other arterials, it, it drops to like, you know, 35. But it stays higher in the, in the um, glomeruli. So that's what I want you to think about here. Um, hydrostatic pressure. 55, hydrostatic pressure here, 35, or here I say 25, and all of the capillaries. I want you to think about the arterial capillary arterial arrangement. Move the top of the slide there. Arterial capillary arterial versus arterial capillary venue. Arterial capillary arterial <coughs> arrangement. What do I mean by that? Our, the first arterial is the afferent one. The capillary bed is the glomerulus, and the second arterial is the efferent arterial. So notice we have an arterial on the other side, not a vein. That provides more resistance, capital R, resistance to blood flow. So when you do that, you create higher pressure in the capillary that's stuck in the middle. More resistance versus less resistance of the vein, there's less pressure here to push filtrate fluids out. Here, it's much higher, so you get a net, uh, well, you get a hydrostatic pressure of 55. Glomerular capillaries, also have greater surface area. So the more R means higher, what we call previously hydrostatic pressure GC. There's basically more filtration pressure than other capillary beds. more pressure to push fluids out. That in conjunction with um, 100 times more surface area. 100 times more surface area. <clears throat> and what we're really talking about there is the filtration membrane I just defined. 100 times more surface area provided by filtration membrane. So those two things, more pressure, more surface area, you, you get the thing that I said earlier. You're filtering your plasma volume 70 times a day. No other capillary bed does that. Does that raise or 
No, because each kidney has its own renal artery. So I don't think that would be a thing. No. If normally a kidney got two renal arteries and you're saying take away one renal artery, I could see a change. Uh, yeah, so filter, plasma, seven times per day. And yeah, the term for that, higher renal clearance, I already wrote it down. Basically, you're going to keep the toxic waste products out of the blood, keep them low in the blood. That's the goal. Here's a picture of the uh, glomeruli, just to impress upon you that you got a million of them, that's a lot of surface area. Okay. So the glomerular filtration rate, I told you how much is filtered per day, but what's the rate per minute? It's about 125 mils per minute. So what I say on the slide is that the kidney's receiving much more than that. The renal artery's putting through something like 775 mils per minute. You only filter 125 mils per minute at the glomerulus, which means the other 650 is going into the efferent arterioles and the other capillary beds. So you filter 125, you excrete about one mil a minute of urine. So input 125, output only one. Filter 125 mils per minute, one mil a minute, excrete. That's going to be your urine production. So, therefore, you're basically, you know, reabsorbing 99%, over 99%. Normal GFR in both kidneys is about 125 mils per minute. It's directly proportional to that NFP we just calculated, that's 10. Changes in GFR normally result from changes in glomerular pressure. However, what I want to teach you is how that usually doesn't happen. GFR is usually well regulated at 125 mils per minute. You don't want to mess with your uh, fluid balance at the kidney because it filters so much. You want to keep it constant. And that's basically what we teach students, how, how to regulate GFR at the kidney. Now, why you want to do that is because if GFR is too high, if you're filtering too much, stuff is going through too fast in the uh, nephron. So the needed substances cannot be reabsorbed quickly, and quickly enough and you lose it to the urine if it's too fast. If GFR is too low and stuff is flowing through the nephron too slowly, everything is reabsorbed, including things that you don't want. So you want to keep it regulated at 125 for proper function. Okay, proper excretion. So the regulation of GFR, it occurs in two ways. Uh, one way is intrinsic, and um, one way depends on nervous innervation. We'll, we'll get to that. So the autoregulation auto is intrinsic. It doesn't depend on nervous innervation to maintain constant GFR. GFR is able to remain relatively constant, 125 mils per minute, despite large changes in blood pressure. So one thing to know, what that means is let's say you're monitoring GFR in a graph and you want to, the goal, keep it 125 mils per minute. Now that's directly related to systemic blood pressure, BP.
I'd say blood pressure is sky high, 200, uh, something like 80. <clears throat> high, low. Um, the idea here is, since we're talking about blood pressure here, you, you would think that blood pressure, when it's super high, that GFR will be super high. And that, that's true. At 200, it starts to skyrocket. Okay? Maybe it's super high, like way up here. When blood pressure is really low, you expect GFR to drop. Not a lot of pressure pushing it through, and that's true too. However, what we see is, um, it looks kind of like this. Like that. Within a wide range between 80 and 200, you keep it relatively constant. It doesn't really skyrocket until you get super high. Or it doesn't really drop off to get super low. So, you know, it, it can really maintain 125 all by itself really well across a wide range of blood pressure changes. And that's why um, we teach these two mechanisms. How does it keep it so steady despite changes in blood pressure? There's an autoregulatory mechanism and a hormonal mechanism. Okay, so let's do this one first. It's called flow dependent tubuloglomerular feedback. How to maintain GFR at 125 mils per minute. So the first one is called flow dependent tubulogomerular feedback. Tubulogomerular. FB feedback. The nephron has a way to feed back on itself. The hormonal mechanism I'll get to it. Let's look at this figure first. This figure is showing us this tubuloglomerular feedback. Let me just take it through the steps. Okay. A good way to self-regulate a flow rate is to monitor the blood coming in. Blood's coming in, afferent arterial. Just monitor it right there. Let's pretend something goes out of whack and GFR increases. I mean, what we've been saying all semester, if something's too high, what do you want to do? Lower it, right? So let's, do, let's see how this kidney nephron accomplishes this flow-dependent tubulo-glomerular feedback. The imbalance is increase, it's too high, so we want to lower it. Now, if you're increasing the filtration at the, at the beginning, you're increasing the flow in the tubule. That's what number two says. Yeah? Is this going to be the rate of Oh, no. The question was asked, uh, is this the written part of the exam? You know, lecture exam seven is in class, and there's no written part. It's just multiple choice. I think I have like something like 60 questions. For lecture seven? Yes. Lecture exam seven. Yeah, lecture exam. Yes. No, so increase the flow in the tubule. Now here, here's the thing. You're gonna here's the thing it doesn't tell you, and I don't appreciate this, so let me tell you. If you're increasing the flow in the tubule, it's too fast, and you don't have time to reabsorb sodium. Should write that down. Therefore, sodium in the filtrate remains high, it remains salty in the filtrate. <clears throat> Right? It's going too fast. The little cell machinery doesn't have time to reabsorb it. So when you get to the macula densa, I, I didn't mention that yet, but that's part of the DCT. You're going to increase flow past the macula densa of the DCT. Flow past macula. Densa. These are cells of the DCT 
There are salt sensors. They detect salt levels. We call them osmoreceptors. <coughs> salt sensor is a little easier to understand. Osmoreceptor. Osmosis, the concentration of salt determines the diffusion of water, right? Osmoreceptor detects the salt level in any fluid. Well, what are they going to detect, the salt detectors? Salt. They're going to detect more salt. It detects the increased sodium. So what's it going to do? There's a reason why, functional reason why it's always flowing by the Bowman's capsule because that's where the vascular pole is. It secretes um, a vasoconstrictive chemical on the afferent arterial because they're really close to each other. It's a paracrine response. That's what it says for number four. Paracrine response from basically goes from DCT, macula densa. Uh, to the inferior arterial. You're secreting something that's going to make the afferent arterial vasoconstrict. So that's the next step. Number five. Afferent arterial. I'll put VC, you know what that means, vasoconstrict the resistance to, to blood flow there, that's going to drop the GFR if you vasoconstrict afferent arterial. Decrease GFR. And you go back and check to see if you did the right thing. You decreased it because the imbalance was you increased it too much. So this works both ways. It works if GFR is too high. It also works if GFR is too low. Now, I don't have a figure for it, but you should be able to reason yourself through it. If GFR is too low, I'll put down arrow, everything's in reverse. You decrease flow in the tubule. Whereas before, you had no time to reabsorb sodium. Now you have too much time to reabsorb sodium. So you reabsorb more sodium because of the slowed down flow rate. Uh, that, that means the filtrate will have less uh, sodium because you have more time to reabsorb. Instead of less time. Therefore, when you flow past macula densa, it detects a drop in salt. So the paracrine response would just be the opposite. Instead of releasing a substance that vasoconstricts, the paracrine response will be to release something that vasodilates. I'll put VD on the bottom here. And that will increase GFR. So this is the feedback. The feedback is you have a salt detector right by the atrial arterial, so you can just feedback on yourself. So this kind of leads to what we call the, the juxtaglomerular apparatus. It includes the salt detector, but it includes other things. Let's look at this picture here. <clears throat> we looked at this before the break. It's the, va it's the vascular pole here. Number one is our salt detector, the osmoreceptor.
Two things. There's more than two things, but these are the only two I want you to know. The third thing is not so important in terms of what we teach here. Number one is pointing to macula densa of the DC tube. These function as osmoreceptors. just got through talking about them. Now, the second thing, it's pointing to smooth muscle cells of the afferent arterial, uh, tunica media. Those cells are called JG cells, juxtacle marrier cells. JG for short, cells. Cool. So these are they're basically specialized smooth muscle cells of the afferent arterial. Specialized smooth muscle cells of afferent arterial. Now, these specialized smooth muscle cells called juxtaglomerular cells have a granular appearance. The, um, the reason is, I'll get to it, but they're also called granular cells for that reason. The granules contain renin. So now you know the cells that have renin. It's these cells right here. These cells function as a baroreceptor because they live in the tunica media. I mean, if there are changes in pressure in the afferent arterial, these cells will detect the change. So granular cells or juxtacomerular cells function as baroreceptors. Osmoreceptors detect changes in sodium. Baroreceptors detect changes in pressure. Basically, they go hand in hand. Um, if blood pressure is low, you've usually lost a lot of electrolytes too. Okay, so they, they kind of go together. So here's that second mechanism to regulate blood pressure. <coughs> Let me go to the next slide here. I want to zoom in on that. Um, thank you. So this is a lot of what we talked about here. Um, here's another way this apparatus can help us maintain blood pressure. Here, the homeostatic imbalance is a drop in blood pressure. We talk about that a lot in this course because cardio is one of the main units. See if we can put the pieces together based on what we've been talking about. If you drop BP, what it says here is you drop GFR. Does that make sense? Drop that, drop that. Just me. Put that down. You drop below. Um, this is the RAS mechanism. This is the not the flow dependent. Because we're going to do something else here. Remember um, when you memorize Renin, the whole cascade? 
This is that. Again. Okay. This is not the automatic one I just got through outline. Just stay with me here. Drop blood pressure, drop GFR. It says decreased sodium concentration at the DCT. Does that make sense? Yeah, because if you have decreased filtration, you slow the flow down, you have more time to reabsorb sodium. So when you get to the DCT, you have less sodium. Drop sodium levels at DCT. The osmoreceptors pick up on that. <clears throat> and it says macula densa leading to renin release. Questions on this side of the board. Boom, 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 boom. Random release. Oh, let's look at the other side. This is a more direct mechanism. That same drop in blood pressure, the JG cells, they're mechanoreceptors, they're baroreceptors. They detect that change, it's dropping, they release renin. These are actually the cells that release the renin. Okay. The figure doesn't really expressly state that, but these have the renin. These detect the salt change and help communicate to these cells to release the renin, but these cells have them. Same drop in BP, call it the JG cells. They have the renin, they detect that change, they release the renin. So both of those things do work together to lead to renin release. <clears throat> if I were you, I'd go back and memorize the, the rest of the cascade if you need to review it. Renin basically is converted. Renin is a cleaver. It converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Now in the lung, there's ACE. ACE will convert it to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 will do a couple of things. It will lead to the release of aldosterone in the adrenal cortex. Right, That targets the kidney. Okay, and what it'll do is you'll increase the sodium uptake in the DCT, which also increases the water uptake. By increasing the blood volume, you increase the blood pressure. It has a more direct effect. Angiotensin II can also constrict the arterioles to help increase blood pressure. That was covered before, and you guys did a good job with that the first time around. It's still here, hasn't gone away. Study it again for the next test. Vascular or the tubular pole? Tubular. Tubular. Now, vascular's up here. I see two arterioles. Which one's that one? Afferent or efferent? Efferent. Efferent. This is the afferent. Now, I notice they cut away the wall so you show you, show you a special cells. If I point it to that, those are the JG cells. The juxtaglomerular cells or granular cells. That's what they're trying to show you there. There is the DCT, but really, what is it? Macula densa. Here's the glomerular capillaries. Why do they put a purple blanket over it? Which layer is it, parietal or visceral? Visceral, there's the parietal layer. If I had to identify that cell, I'm going for protocell. <clears throat> here it is labeled. Um, yeah, we can take a look at that. Here's another one, kind of the same thing. Identify cells. Macula densa. Identify cells. Specifically right here. The JG cells. Now if I label down there, you can just, I'm probably just going for afferent arterial. There's afferent. There's glomerular capillaries, but this is the visceral layer. That's the nucleus of a potocyte. I can even see little filtration slits right there. That's a good model. <clears throat> Here's another picture. 
So that's the podocyte. Okay. That's the efferent. That's the afferent. And um, see that spindle shaped cell? That's a regular speed muscle cell. But you see like the hexagons? Those are the specialized granular, granular cells or JG cells. So a lot of pictures of that. <clears throat> well, the next part after the renal corpuscle is the proximal convoluted tubule. So let's do that. So the strategy now is just go to, to each part, talk about all the physiology. Now, the proximal convoluted tubule is just the tube, just like the distal convoluted tubule. But which one is first after glomerulus? Proximal. So it's getting all the stuff that just got filtered. So there's more stuff to reabsorb. So the cells are bigger. There's more microvilli. There's more mitochondria. These cells do more work than these cells, simply because they, they come first. So they're your most active reabsorbers. Uh, reabsorption is likened to this ferry analogy. Say you're trying to reabsorb glucose. You want to reabsorb all of it. Normally, you should. And um, if your blood sugar is not too high or you glycemic, say you have plenty of transporters that, you know, ferry it across. This is just an analogy. So therefore, you would have no glucose in the urine. Okay. And, you know, these, these transport rates have a rate that's been measured. So they can give a rate there, 200 weeks per minute transport. But if you're hyperglycemic, the, the transporters, there's not enough of them or they can't work fast enough. So you can't ferry it across fast enough. Your rate maxes out. It's called saturation. 375 is the max. And so you might have some glucose spill in the urine, sweet urine. Okay. So that's the idea here. And so the way it's illustrated in books here is you have filtrate on one side, and you have a blood capillary on the other one, maybe vasorecta or paratubular capillary. And we like to teach students, how do you transport stuff across one membrane and the other membrane? And the uh, names of the membranes are luminal membrane on one side. The side that faces the lumen is the side that faces the filtrate. And the side opposite is basolateral side. So that's what we're going to spend time looking at. The reabsorption of... Sodium. Pretty much we're talking about PCT, your most active reabsorbers. <clears throat> However, I like to focus on just the reabsorption of sodium. They reabsorb a lot of things at the PCT. Focus on the reabsorption of sodium. Sodium ions. Because a lot of other things follow sodium. So if you just focus on that one thing, you can see how the, at the PCT, you reabsorb a lot of other things with it. Uh, this is just showing you the percentages of sodium. So right here at the beginning of the PCT, you got 100%. Okay, how much of sodium is getting through that filter? Books say something like 25,000 millimolar sodium daily. Now, at the end, you only excrete 0.4%. That would be 100 milli millimolar of that 25,000. Look at the PCT. You've got 100% there. You get to the end of the PCT, you only have 33% remaining. So the PCT reabsorbs most of it and other things. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. And you're going to spend a lot of time looking at figures like this, where you have the kidney cell of the PCT filtrate the blood. PCT 
T cell in the middle. So on this side, it's filtrate. Pass them by. Then the other side is a, a capillary. tubular capillary. And the goal of reabsorption is to take something, say sodium, and bring it across, get it into the blood. That way you don't lose it to the urine. Um, so I put some numbers in here. Negative 3, negative 70, 0. So you're a positive sodium ion. Here is negative three. Here is more negative. Okay, so across this luminal membrane, if you're a positive ion, do you want to go to where it's more negative? Yes, that's a draw to go from less negative to more negative, and you're positive, you're attracted to that, okay? Let's consider the other side, basal lateral. Now you're a positive sodium ion in the cell. You're in negative 70, and it's more positive outside the cell. Is that a draw? Yes or no? No. If you're positive, you don't want to go towards more positive. Okay, let's think of another, something else. Concentration gradients. 145, 15, 145. Yeah. You're a step ahead, that's good. <clears throat> so two separate things, the electric, electrical gradient, but also the chemical concentration gradient. If you're 145 outside, 15 inside, don't you want to go from high to low? Yeah. So for the luminal membrane, the electrochemical gradient favors going into cell. So they call this movement across this membrane downhill. It would not require ATP if you had the right channel there. However, on this side, the electrochemical gradient to go from low to high, it's uphill, okay? It's, you gotta like expand the ATP to get across this membrane. To get across there, that would be uphill. So that's why I say here at the bottom of the slide. Entry of sodium into the cell through the luminal membrane is downhill. Exit of sodium out of the cell through the basal lateral membrane is uphill. Now here's the figure from your book. Let me just kind of say basically what you're going to talk about here. For this to work, to go downhill, uphill, you have to create this kind of negative environment here, this negative 70. So, You can study this on your own, and these figures are very daunting. They have all these steps. They have all this stuff here that you're supposed to understand. That's why I said focus on one thing, the reabsorption of what? Salt. Sodium. Yeah, salt. Just focus on that one thing, and everything else falls into place. And water falls. And water will fall. Yeah, that's one thing that follows. Here's number one. That's where you start, right there. I zoomed in on it, but what membrane was this in? Is this luminal or basal lateral? This is basal lateral, close to the blood. This is where we start. And you've studied this before, that's a good thing. You're thinking to yourself, I, no I didn't, I never studied this. Yes, you did. Go back to 430. Remember studying resting membrane potential? 
Remember studying the sodium potassium ATPase thing? That's it. Three, two, we're the same thing. Okay, so this is the basal auto membrane. One molecule let's focus on here is the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Sodium potassium. Yeah. Sorry. Basolateral membrane. Sodium potassium ATPase. You're expending ATP to pump out sodium because it's uphill, right? You exchange for two potassiums. However, this cell is very permeable to potassium. Potassium is pumped in, but leaks right back out. So you're pumping out positive sodium, and then positive potassium is leaking back out. That creates a very you know, negative intracellular environment. Well, let me just go back a slide. But by the action of that pump, you create negative 70, 15 on the inside of the cell. Okay? Because you're pumping out sodium and you're all the positive charges leaving. By the action of this pump, well, basically you're pumping out sodium. I think even reading it in your book, uh, she calls it the, the sodium exodus, just getting it all out. Sodium exodus. So that makes the concentration low, 15. Concentration low. That was that 15 millimolar I talked about before. Well, the other thing is you're pumping out positive sodium, but then positive potassium is leaking out. <clears throat> so the thing is, it creates a negative intracellular environment. And that's the, the negative 70, which is the same as the resting potential for a, a neuron, right? So let's go back to the slide I was on. Okay, great. So this pump created the downhill environment for this memory, right? Because it's like negative and 15 makes this downhill. So let's go to the other membrane, the luminal membrane. Focus on this molecule right there. This one here. So um, this is a co-transporter, and what co-transporters do is they transport two different molecules across the membrane in the same direction. So just for an example, uh, let's say the direction of transport is this way, it's x and it's y. That's called co-transport, two things crossing the membrane. I guess you could reverse that. One goes one way, one goes the other way, like the sodium potassium ATPase pump. That would be counter transport. Okay, but we're 
we're talking about a co-transporter. I want to call it a, a sodium glucose co-transporter. I see dotted line, solid line. On this figure, it means active primary and secondary active transport. Now it's keyed out on the bottom there. A primary active transport, do you hydrolyze ATP? Yes. Secondary active transporter, do they hydrolyze ATP? Yes or no? No. But they depend on the action of the primary ones. This one is creating a concentration gradient that this one uses. The primary creates a concentration gradient that the secondary uses. The primary hydrolyzes ATP. The secondary does not. It just uses the downhill gradient. Okay. So what happens is sodium, it just uses this co-transporter. It just follow, It just goes downhill, right? Quote, unquote. This is an example of secondary active transport. Now, sodium is the most plentiful ion being reabsorbed. Um, and basically, you're going to take advantage of that energy of sodium going downhill, and other things are going to go with it. For example, glucose. Glucose uses the quote unquote downhill energy of sodium co-transported with it. So it's kind of like a bonus. Sodium's going downhill. Is glucose? Probably not. It doesn't matter. It's like it's got a free ride. Okay? Yeah, well, um, I wouldn't say it's most important, but salt is used to, to reabsorb other things. Look what the figure says. I chose glucose as an example. You can co-transport glucose with the sodium, amino acids with the sodium, vitamins with the sodium. Okay, so that's why I said just focus on sodium because you got these co-transporters. Everything else goes with it. So whatever you want to reabsorb, it can happen based on. The primary, secondary, active transport of sodium. Now, look at number four. What follows sodium reabsorption? Water. <clears throat> Another thing to point out. I didn't emphasize it, but we're talking about a tube lined with all of these cells. And all the cells are linked together by tight junctions, shown right here. That, that's not random. It's on this side. It's not on this side. It's not in the middle. It's kind of likened to, you know, like a, the plastic rings that hold a can of Coke. They turn it on the side. It's like those plastic rings that hold the cans of Coke together are like these tight junctions. So that, it's difficult for things to slip through the cells. It's, uh, everything that is reabsorbed is usually cell mediated. <clears throat> okay. You know, I think I could stop here. I'm running out of steam.